for a long time, Roger Bear was the greatest Ranger of all time. When you thought New York Rangers, you said, that's Roger Bear's team. He was a tremendous hockey player, one of the best hockey players to ever put the New York Rangers uniform on. Rod was an offensive weapon. He was a type of player that could thread the needle with a shot. He could thread the needle with a pass. Middle, get your the middle, get your the From 20 feet, he could slap the puck and hit the head of a pimp. Terrific shot and awareness of uh, what's going on around him. And considering that he wasn't a big guy, he was a pretty fearless player. He's a legend on and off the ice. And you think of New York Rangers, you gotta, you gotta think of him. I'll never forget uh, coming to the Rangers in the early 90s and meeting Rod and just thinking class, gentleman, someone that really understands the honor of being a Ranger. Rod Gilbert is a Madison Square Garden legend, but his spectacular career almost ended before it even began. In the spring of 1961, Gilbert was playing for the Guelph Royals when he got the call he'd been waiting for. I was coming to play for the Rangers. I was the supposedly the, the number one prospect in the juniors to make it to the NHL until I had that infamous accident where I broke my back. It's unclear what he tripped on. Was it a hot dog wrapper? Was it an ice cream top? Or just a piece of debris? He was skating full tilt. So I slipped, and I lost my edge, and I completely destroyed my uh, fourth vertebrae. And I was paralyzed like, on the ice, and they brought me out, took me to the hospital. The injury was profound because, first of all, it delayed his arrival in New York. And secondly, his back was a question whether or not he'd be able to play. The doctor says, well, if you want to walk again, we're going to perform a spinal fusion. I said, walk, I want to play hockey. That's all I know, I mean. So he said, well, we can't guarantee you that, but let's try. Now, you start taking those back operations uh, with what they can do today, it's totally different. And that was very, very painful operation. The bones got infected both you know, my back and my leg. And it was kind of trying experience, and, but I had the fate. You know, like I, I made a lot of deals with the big guy. Nothing was going to stop him from being the NHL player. You know, his back was literally going to have to fall off. And for a while, that was a real possibility. The Rangers, uh, despite the back problems, wanted to see what he could do. And they built this back brace for him which was very constrictive. I was very difficult. The, my breathing was hampered. But you know what? I was so happy like, to be able to do it. So this wasn't a big compromise for me to be a little bit like, uncomfortable. But, uh, I enjoyed doing what I did. I was passionate about it. Not too many people would come back from that, believe me, but they never stopped him from being the type of hockey player he was. The young Gilbert persevered, and a year later he got the surprise of a lifetime when he was called up to the Rangers for Game 3 of the Stanley Cup semifinals against Toronto. The people had been waiting for me, actually. They were told that there was a kid in the minors and he was going to change the Rangers around. And this was very exciting. I mean, who knew how good the kid would be? And so we wound up winning that game, and I got an assist at the end of the game and first star. But it wasn't until the next game, which was so important because it tied the series. It was like a, a dream, you know, come true at that time. And I asked Mus Patrick, our coach at the time, I says, you better wake me up because this is not real. And the Rangers, although they lost, were very competitive in that series. And it was quite obvious from his performance that this indeed was the face of the Rangers to come. Ranger fans knew what a special player they had in Rod Gilbert. But it was on February 24th, 1968, that he became an NHL superstar. We were playing the Montreal Canadiens in Montreal, and uh, they had won 20 straight games at home. I was very successful that night, and even more grateful because of where it had happened. Rod Gilbert that night had the greatest game of any hockey player I've ever seen. And I've seen all the best that there is. I took 16 shots and wound up scoring four goals and had one assist. And uh, I swear I could have scored about eight. But, you know, like, uh, I was happy with that result. 
I was at that game in Montreal when Rod got the four goals, and I just remember how thrilled he was to do it in Montreal, where he grew up. I had my, my mom and dad, my sisters, my brothers, and many nephews, and uh, they got to uh, witness it. But to play as well as he played that night against the Canadians was almost mythical. If he wasn't in everybody's consciousness at the start of the game, he surely was by the time the next morning's papers came out. Rod Gilbert has three great loves in his life. He loves hockey, he loves the New York Rangers, and he loves New York City. Rod felt that sense that he was meant to be here. He truly is a New Yorker in every sense of the word. I love the art, I love the, uh, the excitement, I love the people. New Yorkers bonded with him in a way that was unlike the arm's length manner that they had with other players who weren't quite as interested in enjoying the many things that New York has to offer. Rod had a lot of flair, a lot of flash, a lot of style. He dressed good. He had that great French accent. Rod was a good-looking guy. He was single. He was certainly a star, liked the nightlife, and uh, certainly became a celebrity. He had a reputation as a playboy, but he knew when to think just about hockey. We had 11 o'clock curfew, and, and he made it. You know, night after game, when you're off the next day, you can stay out later. But he policed himself very well. I'm not out at the wrong time, and I'm not drinking abusively. Like, you know, it's like all these things that maybe would make the people think that I'm cheating my profession. He encouraged you to kind of explore Many of us didn't recognize that that was okay to do, and actually it was pretty important to do, in all honesty. Becoming a New York icon was the culmination of a long journey for Roderick Gabriel Gilbert, who was born on July 1st, 1941, in Montreal, Quebec. Typical hockey land in Canada. Everybody as a kid played hockey. My mom would uh, put my boots into my brother's skates that's how I started to learn. So you just bobble a little bit, and then you finally get it. Rod and his family lived in a small town next to the Brothers of the Sacred Heart Boarding School, which took boys from all around Quebec. And one of the boys was Jean Rattel. And when Rod would play on the school rink, he took a liking to Rattel. When I saw him play, I said, you play with me all the time, OK? Like, um, we'll, be, we'll be friends. and. It was quite an experience meeting him at that age. Gilbert's talent was obvious at an early age, and he was invited to play on a semi-pro team when he was just 14 years old, with men almost twice his age. His skill was on their level, but his size wasn't, so he had to really uh, establish a physical presence to show that he had the ability to take abuse. I got to play and, and learn faster because you're playing at a higher level. And that's where the scout that was assigned by the Rangers, Ivan Prudhomme, he's the guy that discovered me and then actually offered me to go to Guelph, Ontario, which was a farm team for the New York Rangers. When Rod was invited to Guelph, he was going to an English-speaking town, and he couldn't speak. English. So this was a challenge to him. I mean, basically, he was going to a foreign country. It was tough to, uh, to ask a girl, may I carry your books home? I couldn't even say that. So I had a very, very difficult time uh, adjusting. There's a lot of youngsters at that age that did that, that did leave and went somewhere, but just didn't, couldn't crack it and didn't stick with it. I stuck there, and then I brought John Rattel the next year. Rod said, listen, I'll play, but you've got to get this other guy. I've played with him for many years, and we'd be great together. And uh, that's how they played on a little higher level. While at Guelph, Gilbert and Rattel honed their skills under the tutelage of the man who would coach them for most of their Rangers careers, Emile Francis. Emile came uh, my last year in Guelph. I was, it was a blessing because I, I had it with the other coach. The first day uh, I looked at him, I said to myself, this is the guy you're going to have to build a team around. It was pretty evident. Emil had a great influence on both of those players, Rod and Sean in particular. And Emil became somewhat of a father figure to them. 
Emil took over and took us all the way to the championship, and I got most valuable player that year. He made Rod very comfortable. If Rod wasn't comfortable in Guelph, who knows where he would have wound up. He may not have made the Rangers. By the early 70s, Rod Gilbert was the face of the Rangers and part of what would become one of the most productive lines in hockey history. Oh, the gag line. It was simply the best line in the history of the New York Rangers. It was Vic Hadfield on the left wing, John Rattel at center, and Rod Gilbert on the right. The gag line was nicknamed so for a goal a game line, which they pretty much did. They had a blend. Rattel was the artist, slick, beautiful passer. And they had Rod. Rod had great outside speed, had a great slap shot. We had played together all along you know, from the time we were 10 years old. We couldn't make plays without even, you know, looking at each other or talking to each other. It was instinctive. It was uncanny how they could play together. And then, of course, putting Vic with them, too, uh, just worked out perfectly. Vic would certainly score in his own right. He was a 50-goal scorer, but he was a person to create the space to whatever extent was necessary for Rattel and Gilbert. He would go get it and then feed John, and John would feed me, and it was like an automatic success. Somebody has to be aggressive, and that was my role, to be aggressive. So you have three fellows that are complimenting each other all the way along. The 71-72 season was really the pinnacle of the gag line. So everybody kind of thought, well, they'll certainly get to the finals, and this could be a cup year. We were a very complete team. You know, starting in that with Eddie Jackman and Jill Villemier. Rod obviously being a superstar, Jean and Vic being superstars, Brad Park being a superstar. There were no holes in that lineup. The Rangers would battle all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals, where they would meet the Boston Bruins. It was the first time the Rangers had made it to the finals since 1950. The Rangers and the Bruins had, uh, you know, established a rival, you know, back in the, the 50s, going to the 60s, and we didn't like each other at all. We had total disrespect for one another. Rod had a great series, as I recall. Here's Rattel out front, a cross shot, goal! Gilbert has put Rangers ahead, He always played good in the playoffs. I mean, uh, he averaged just under a point a game, which is extraordinary. There's a deflected shot in front by number seven, Gilbert. What I remember most about the series was the fact that the Rangers showed that they could come back. We were down three games to one. We had to win to Boston and win the fifth game. Everybody thinks the Bruins are going to win, and the Rangers show a lot of courage, a lot of guts, a lot of comeback ability. And it's all over. The Rangers have beaten the Bruins. And they come back to New York, and now the feeling was that they could beat these guys. We came back to the gardens and we were like, you know, we're losing by one nothing in the third period. And at that time, all of a sudden, or got loose. We ran into a hot, hot Bruins team with Bobby Orr being probably the greatest player at that time. The Bruins had Bobby Orr, and he almost single-handedly took over, certainly game six. And the Bruins won the Stanley Cup. It was like anything, we were disappointed. Disappointed, well, that's a very uh, light way of putting it. We were just, it was devastation. That's the worst feeling in the world. When it's over, when you wake up the next morning, it feels like somebody in your family just died. It was very frustrating, but then again, it gave us hope for the next year. Later that summer, with the loss of the Stanley Cup fresh in his memory, Rod Gilbert would join Team Canada in an eight-game series against the Soviet Union, known as the Summit Series. Rod being invited to play in this tournament was a huge feather in his cap and just showed where he, he was in terms of NHL stardom. It was very emotional. Brad was also part of the uh, Summit Series with John and, and Vic and I. The Soviets were better conditioned, better trained, better coached in all honesty. We dug ourselves into a huge hole by the time we left Canada after four games. We'd only won one game. Went to Moscow for four games in the height of the Cold War. And we had to win the last three games in order to win the series. And won the eighth game with 30 seconds to go. 
mean, the whole country just got up and just, you know, just yelled uh, hallelujah all at once. And those guys will forever be bound by that. For Canada to come back, it was a big deal for Rod. It was a big plus. It certainly erased the uh, sorrow of losing to the Bruins in the finals. Well, he said his greatest moment was in the Summit Series, and he said that was his Stanley Cup. It's the sporting event of the century, and people still talk about it like it was yesterday. It's still like in their heart. Ceiling. During the 1973-74 season, Rod Gilbert would claim two Rangers records when he became the all-time leader in goals and points scored by passing Andy Bathgate. He was my idol. Had he played longer, I would have never passed him. He was that great. Here's Rattel out front, a cross shot, goal! Gilbert has put Rangers ahead, three to one. I played during the good years when the, the team was complete and that's where I was producing. He was still in his early 30s, you know, maybe old for an NHL player at that time, but he still had that vitality and the desire. He was in good shape, you know, and he was, he looked young and everything else compared to some of the other guys that were his age. Took very good care of himself, and he could play. Once the uh, Bruin series of 72 was in the rearview mirror, there was a kind of a malaise that slowly descended on the Ranger team. It did not affect Rod, and that's to his credit. That this team, as great as it was and had been, had simply run out of chances to win. It was time to dismantle and start building anew. The core of that team was Jockerman, Park, Hadfield, Rattel, and Gilbert. And now Hadfield would be the first to go, Jockerman would go, In November of 1975, Rod Gilbert and the rest of the hockey world were shocked when the Rangers traded Jean Rattel and Brad Park to the Boston Bruins for Phil Esposito and Carol Vadney. Well, we were all kind of devastated. That hit the, the Ranger fans and all of us like a thunderclap. I think that was one of the hardest things in my career other than my injuries. Taking Rattel away from me was just like taking my left arm and my heart was broken for sure because we had not accomplished what we set up to do. It was the toughest deal I ever made because they had contributed so much to the New York Rangers. That was a very difficult deal. Something had to be done to shake them up. But the one constant was that Rod was there to play hard for them. And that was the bright spot. Gilbert continued to excel as the Rangers struggled, but management was still not happy with the direction of the team. The worst thing that ever happened to Ron Bear was John Ferguson being named the general manager of the Rangers. That was disastrous, just disastrous. Because Ferguson sort of wanted full control of the team. He wanted to control the young kids. And I was like too established here for him to be able to do that completely. So we decided it was time for me to go. He just felt that Rod had reached the end of the road, but the way it had happened, it was a shocking thing. This was a person who deserved much better treatment, who was revered by his fans, who had represented his team with great, great dignity and distinction, and it was wrong. I didn't have the heart to play anywhere else if I couldn't accomplish what I was set up to do here in New York. That was enough. Rod Gilbert's place in Rangers history was solidified in 1979, when he became the first Ranger ever to have his number retired. I can't think of anybody that has represented the Rangers in New York as well as him. He symbolized so many great things about his era, his team, and his venue. Since I was the first one, you know, you don't realize the importance and the honor to have your number immortalize and be in Madison Square Garden, uh, my home. I'll never forget it. Rod represents everything that everyone else after him that had worn that jersey want to be. Rod was one of the great players and 
range of history, and not only range of history in the National Hockey League. In 1982, he did go into the Hall of Fame. Qualifications for the Hall of Fame, you have to be dedicated to the sport, Rod was. You have to be an exceptional talent, Rod was. He was like a perfect fit for the Hall of Fame. When you get elected in a special group of people that had played the game uh, at the very, very high level, it's quite stunning. Rod Gilbert continues to be an integral part of the Rangers organization in his role as Director of Special Projects and Community Relations. Rod Gilbert, even today, is, is really Mr. Ranger to many people. Rod will always go out of his way to do something to shine the right light on the Rangers. If you go to any kind of charity event, he'll be there. Once I put that sweater on, he was the first one up, and you know, you're a part of the family now, and I mean, he doesn't have to do that. I'm still here in New York doing things that I love, and I'm still hired by Madison Square Garden, and so I'm still in the middle of it <laughs> and still enjoying it. He has that positive energy. He's the type of guy you'll want to be around. And uh, Rod is, is, is truly the benchmark for what a Ranger is all about. To have been able to participate in what you were the most passionate about and also combine that to come to a place where it was so appreciated is very gratifying and fulfilling. New York has been tremendous and I'm very, very blessed.